The first panel that we have is with four fantastic women in the space uh, talking about artistry unleashed, generative AI shaping fashion, art, and cultural expression. I will let them all introduce themselves, but this is, of course, very expertly moderated by Katie Henderson. Come up on stage, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, we're very excited to be here. Still working. Um, as you just mentioned, first discussion will be about AI um, and history. Um, we have an incredible roster of women here today. We're pioneers in the industry. And when we see the potential and growth and innovation, it's clear why fashion has taken such a stake in the space. Uh, the fusion of fashion and genitive AI offers an enormous playground for creativity, innovation, and an immersive experiences. Uh, the metaverse has become an inaugural part of the fashion landscape and offers brand a, a new avenue to connect with consumers in an interactive way. Open the doors to expensive opportunities for personal expression, optimization, community building. Fashion is about looking for, to, towards the future and finding new ways of doing things. By definition, fashion is changing the way we do things. So today we look further into technology means the industry and an industry like fashion where creativity is such a big part of the value it offers and a space where creativity has been so romanticized. Let's analyze the opportunity and challenges generative AI brings to the creative fashion industry. And we'll, I would love to start by introducing Louise who strives to allow everyone to become their own creator. Hi, can you hear me? It's okay, it's quite loud, isn't it? It's quite loud, so we have to really shout. Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> okay, yeah, so I had, I came into this industry, this innovation industry, about three years ago, and after sort of a long career in fashion, where I was working for corporates and um, been a CEO of a brand called Shrimps, and I've done created lots of startups. Um, there was a fundamental problem with all of the fashion industry, really. It's really, really wasteful. There's long buying cycles. You don't know what the customer wants. And so when digital fashion first came into kind of fruition, you know, in DressX and the Fabricant three years ago, I thought, why can't we use this digital technology to try to almost spin fashion on its head. So instead of going physical to digital, which is what traditional fashion brands do, why don't we go digital to physical? And then if we can go digital to physical, that means that we can create the digital first and test it on the customer, on an audience before we go into production or at least get a read for what people want. So we started that, I set about creating a company called Digital Twin. We work with creators, we work with gaming companies, and we work with them on their digital to physical strategy because in, it, you know in 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 our in my opinion this is the way forward and this is how we can really ideate um and understand what people want first and i guess along this journey we've realized that there's a gap in the market for technology from digital to physical so we're also working really hard to build technology using ai that will automate digital to physical workflow it's very complicated and we'll go into that a bit more, but also the digital to gaming. So 3D to gaming is a very complicated process and 3D to physical is really complicated as well. So our job at Digital Twin is working out how we can automate these processes as seamlessly as possible um, to reduce costs, reduce barriers to entry, so to really break down this creative economy and allow lots more people to have their own fashion collections for reasonable, accessible cost. Hi everyone, my name is Adriana. So similarly to Louise, I've been in the fashion industry for over a decade and I'm an art director and fashion illustrator. I've worked with loads of 
luxury fashion brands. Um, I specialize in life experience where I'm a life illustrator. So I'm very involved in events and uh, having this one-to-one -one, um, custom experience with my uh, clients. Um, I got into this space as well about three years ago during COVID where um, a lot of projects were just going um, on hold or obviously production itself was going a bit bad and there was a lot of issues, right? So myself as well, after 10 years in the industry, I felt like I was craving some difference and innovation in the fashion industry because there was a lot of things I disagreed. One of the sustainability aspects as well. Um, just like I felt like fashion needed a fresh breath and Thankfully, I discovered digital fashion and started from NFTs, where I probably was one of the very first, um, I don't want to say the first, but probably I was fashion illustrator who entered the space. I had my work sold out, but then I was like, okay, what's next? I'm into this world. I want to see this change going in this industry. I really love fashion, but there was a lot of things I felt I needed a revamp. So digital fashion came in. I got completely hooked as an art director. Uh, learning about this space and uh, seeing what's the potential, what can we do better going forward. What you also mentioned, a lot of aspects about digital aspects. So what I do currently is I still do our direction, but focused on new tech involved in the industry, using a lot of Gen AI as well. I still am an artist in the traditional space, but I actually did an um, event recently with Future Plus, which was a amazing where we implemented the NFC technology for my life illustration experience. So for me, bridging the gap between this traditional world and fashion going further, what's next and how we can implement new tech for creativity. Um, well, just um, innovation, I would say in a nutshell, is what I'm really driven by and how can we implement it for brands that want to enter this space and in a most feasible and creative and impactful way. I love how both of you are talking about the connection of the physical space with the uh, real-time uh, fashion industry. And I love that we are all here pioneers coming from traditional fashion backgrounds or uh, our art backgrounds uh, and connecting the Web3 space. Uh, I as well have been in the space for over 10 years, I suppose. Um, I like to call myself a fashion futurist because it's the easiest way to explain what my job encompasses. I connect uh, cutting-edge technologies such as AI. AI, XR, spatial computing with uh, luxury and technological companies creating different solutions and experiences. I, for instance, have uh, curated the very first VR Metaverse Fashion Week, where we have built a whole Metaverse fashion world in virtual reality. And then we also had models walking the physical catwalk, wearing uh, body tracking and Tesla suits on the physical catwalk when their avatars powered by AI and uh, AR were walking in the uh, virtual catwalk. So that was one of the first use cases of fidget catwalks and uh, how you can use AR, XR in the fashion to actually bring more customers and audience to the space. Um, I was selected as one of the first designers for the AI Fashion Week that happened. And uh, a lot of people ask me, what is AI Fashion Week? Is it a physical event? Is it a virtual event? Well, uh, it also encompasses the two realms of fashion, it opens up the opportunity for a broader audience to have a grasp into what the future of fashion might look like. Um, also, my journey started um, in a very interesting way. I was looking into industrial uh, use cases of what are the technologies that uh, industrial companies are using. And nine years ago, I believe, uh, I 3D printed this belt, which kind of served as the open gate for uh, me looking into the future of fashion and uh, innovation fashion. And this started with the belt. I continued with uh, AI activations for Dolce & Gabbana for their NFT um, collection, um, DNG family, where they have received a digital wearable uh, created by AI, which was one of the first use cases for me, uh, using AI in the process of creation. And I believe that we are on the edge of the new era of uh, creation, co-creation, and I'm uh, looking forward to see where we are going together. Thank you so much. It's so nice to see a full panel of women in tech. What an amazing lineup. Um, you guys all have incredible backgrounds and have been pioneers. I'd love to discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages that generative AI brings into the fashion design space. Um, yeah, let's talk about the advantages first. I know we're working on a lot of good projects that uh, 
you know, couldn't possibly be done a few years ago. Uh, so just a couple of use cases that we're, and companies that we're working with. One of them is a gaming company and they have created a tool in game um, where all of the users can use generative AI to be able to design their own clothing. And that means that not only can you go into a digital fashion game and dress up, you can go in and you can then create your own digital outfit. And then once you've created your own outfit, you can go to the marketplace and you can sell it. So there's monetization potential for a whole new wave of gamers, you know, teenagers, like it's opening up the doors for creativity. And I think it is breaking down all these barriers. You don't have to have a degree in fashion and have paid X amount of money to study. You can create things easily with these tools. So it's almost like a different skill set. And if we're talking about advantages and disadvantages together, like the disadvantage with that is that you say to generative AI, I'd like a zebra print. And um, of course, so we're working with them to ideate the digital to the physical so that we can not only have these digital outfits for sale within the game, but we can make the physical afterwards. So it's, it's all about digital. So that's what we do. But when we, turn, when we try to turn the digital into the, the AI, generative AI image into a physical garment, it's actually really complicated. So we have a little workaround with this company where we have like 20 templates. They can't change the templates. They're connected to physical patterns. But when they, when they say a zebra print, it comes up with quite a basic zebra print because generative AI is trained on open source and open source is only as good as the knowledge that it can find on the internet and, and the open web. And, and it's not trained on fashion. It, it, so it's, it's almost like the problem is, is that the generative AI isn't trained on fashion prints. And so it comes up with things that actually aren't commercial. So when we're thinking about turning it from a digital to physical, this is our main challenge. And also you don't really know where that information has come from. And IP is very, very questionable around it. So I think these are the two main challenges for us. And we're actually going, you know, we're working on solving it, but. Yes, so I think that there's with new things, there's always an opportunity and I think there's a lot of fear around AI in general. And I'm talking from like a creative perspective because um, there's stigma around AI, obviously, about stealing from other artists. I get that obviously there's a questionable IP rights involved in open AI as well. Um, but I like to say that it's a revolution and it's impossible to stop it right now. So how I see it from perspective, even the history of arts, it's better to look into the fear into the eyes and be a part of it rather than be out front by people who are actually dared to venture and explore AI. So that's why I was thinking a year ago when I started to just like explore it as an art director. And obviously I'm used to working with um, production teams or with myself as a designer and just like drawing and an illustrator. But I was like curious and that's what drives me in general in the fashion industry is the curiosity was the next thing and just embracing it. Um, so I think the huge potential in the AI is obviously the freedom of creativity. That what is essential is that creativity is still owned by humans. I think that's something that's deeply encored as being an artist. And I see AI as another tool of exploration and self-expression. So um, how I start to approach it in a commercial way, it's a, obviously a process where you can talk to the brands. I did work with um, on a campaign with Selfridges and uh, a beauty brand called Skin Design London. That was actually my first campaign I've done where we have combined the photo shoots with real products and then implemented AI onto it. So that was the way, it's one of the ways to how we can overcome the copyrights issue where there's an element of what, of a, of a actual um, production being done physically. And I think that's the way to go around it. It's how I choose to go around it as well. Um, and then there's brands or agencies that are exploring it behind the scenes, obviously when it comes to uh, mood boards or just like a production process of how potentially 
uh, the final product or production is going to look like. So I feel like it's a huge advantage where instead of doing a sketch a sketch uh, sketches of the storyboards or mood boards, this is how you can actually show the final outcome. Um, and another thing is just like it's a, I see it as a new wave of career um, is AI prompt artists because believe me or not, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you here have already tried ChatGPT, Midjourney, all these platforms where you can explore yourself. It's actually not that easy to come up with something what you actually have in your mind. So it's another skill set. And I think it's a huge opportunity now to be on it, even though we're over flooded by other AI artists. I feel like it's very challenging to create your own voice in it and your own narrative and your own aesthetic. And that's what I focus on. And obviously, how can I implement the brands that don't have a huge budget to create something insanely beautiful, crazy, and AI actually allows you to come into this world and have a production that's the level of the biggest uh, luxury houses, right? So this is the advantages. The disadvantages is obviously um, the copyrights. I was actually interested to watch an um, interview with a um, CTO of OpenAI where the journalist is asking her, so where's this all, um, what is it based on? And she's like answering, yeah, it's Shutterstock. And, and then going deeper, she's like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, wow. Okay. So if, if the CTO doesn't know where this all comes from, it's a bit of a concern. It's a little bit of a concern, but I think again, right now, as it's all in progress, it's, it's so important to tap into it and work on it, develop your craft. There's so many tools and I'm very interested in this. I'm actually totally diving deep as an artist. I love doing it. I'm currently working on um, my next uh, personal big thing is uh, my AI music video. I'm also a singer songwriter behind the scenes. And this is the cap um, promoting this project. It's a digital cap where you can actually scan it and um, you get access to next steps of this production. So for me, it's an amazing tool how AI is helping me to create a music video that in the past would I would just spend so much money on productions as an independent artist and with AI I want to show that, that you can create something completely new and innovative with a much more, you know, uh, less budget. So, yeah, I mean, advantages and advantages like everything, but I'm loving it. I'm in for it. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Well, one of my favorites, uh authors and culture criticists, uh, Walter Benjamin uh, wrote an essay about um, um, the era of uh, mechanical replication uh, when the Industrial Revolution started in the beginning of the 20th century. We were witnessing the start of what we are still experiencing now, and that is uh, the d decay in the art industry per se, where it's all about uh, not automation, but uh, uh, some sort of a internal communication within ourselves as artists. Now we communicate with the machine that is serving as a second brain. And uh, we are seeing different uh, use cases, which is actually great that now we are talking not about potential use cases, but about something that's uh, already here in the industry, either uh, in filmmaking, music, uh, music video making, uh, generating uh, 3D assets that I hope will be in the future. So you, Luis, uh, will be able to generate uh, ideas but also then produce them physically, which uh, me as a creator as well, I know that a lot of designers are using Midjourney or other generative tools to create designs, but it's not just about the visual aspect of design, but it's so much about the technical part, which obviously AI is not really uh, replicating perfectly. And uh, you can really see either artists or designers who have the background in uh, traditional design and fashion, or they have jumped uh, jumped into the space briefly because of the hype around it. Uh, but with the emergence of tools, I really hope that 3D uh, generation is going to come soon because that's when the next iteration of the internet is going to have to happen. The metaverse that we all probably were really anticipating and it didn't really happen yet. I believe with the uh, convergence of AI, uh, Gen AI will happen soon. I recently had a chat with a uh, uh, Alvin Van Grayling, who is an author of a, this groundbreaking book, it's called Our Next Reality. He wrote about the next convergence of the internet. So AI-powered metaverse, uh, once uh, it becomes a reality, once we have uh, AI, AR augmented glasses or lenses, or even our tools will be uh, fully um, integrated within AI and our brains, we'll be able to 
experience, not just fashion, because it's not about fashion at all. It's about the whole cultural shift that we are experiencing. This is something that uh, we'll definitely uh, be looking forward to. Also, uh, as you were talking about the biases, about different implications uh, when it comes to authorship, uh, the recent case of uh, Scarlett Johansson and OpenAI just came to mind. Um, I believe that our identities voices, the way we look, the way we talk should be preserved. Uh, one of the companies I was working with, uh, it's the metaverse company, Somnium Space. They have a fully integrated VR metaverse. And one of their functions is called living forever mode, which means that once you're in the metaverse, uh, you if you agree uh, to have all of your data being stored for the whole duration of your life in the metaverse, all the data of how you walk, what you say, how you say it will be stored. And after the death, uh, your AI avatar can still exist in the metaverse and talk to the future generations, which for some sounds like a very uh, black mirror move. For me, uh, I see a lot of opportunities for, let's say, uh, philosophers, authors, scientists that a lot of kids want to talk to, but there is no opportunity for them to travel and talk to all these great minds. If those minds are then uh, allowed to put in the metaverse and the AI mind, and uh, by that will support education and um, have a bigger uh, scientific approach to whatever is happening in the education currently. I feel it's uh, another great use case to think of. It's a sort of a renaissance. Uh, if we look at renaissance paintings that are in the museums, this basically is a preservation of a personal identity, but it's a 2D painting. In the future for us, it's not just photos that we're posting on Instagram, it's not just videos that yes, do encompass some of your personality. Uh, it's the AI avatar that is showing who you actually were besides the looks, besides the, some of the ideas that were written in the book. It's the whole eco space that we can create for us, for the future generations to uh, live upon. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, and you mentioned something really interesting. There was like the big fear around AI. Um, since you guys are all pioneers in a specific areas, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this big fear of everyone losing their jobs, specifically in this creative design space, because it's it's very niche. And like you said, it's moving very quickly, but what does that mean? Does it mean we need to pick up the skills to prompt. What skills would you say are most advantages right now? And where do you think that we could still develop? I think it's about jobs changing. I don't think it's about anything being replaced. Uh, just just think about this. For we, we are trying to automate 3D design to product, like a pattern ready production. That means that the role of a pattern cutter that would normally be creating patterns will reduce. So that that role won't be as important in the future because we can use machine learning to train patterns and to train things that we would have had to do manually. But that doesn't mean that pattern cutter doesn't have a job. There are millions of patterns that need to be trained for all these different companies. And, you know, I do believe, I mean, we're training our own model with our own patterns and our own like data sets. And so that we can build these miniature AI models that are our IP protected um, and where everybody holds their own data and brands will be doing that long term. I mean, we will all use AI to automate and reduce work where we can, but that doesn't mean to say that that job isn't existing. There's a huge amount of jobs that will be created with AI. And I think I've got two daughters and they're 12 and 14. And I'm constantly saying you need to do computer science. They're like, no, I don't want to do that, mom. I'm like, but you, this is where the future is. This is where the work is. And I do think it's about education. I think it's about educating from a very young level, especially women and girls, especially who think that computer science and all this techie stuff is really uncool. It actually needs to be taught in a way that makes it a bit sexy, like through dance or through creativity so that they can go into something more technical. So I think roles are going to be shifting into more technical prompt basis, 100%. But I don't think that will ever mean that there's going to be less jobs available. They're just going to change. So it's the evol evolution of technology. Just because the internet was created didn't mean that we were all out of a job. 
I mean, it's just a new stage. Yes, and I agree a lot of points you made um, about work and jobs being just reinvented. Actually, it makes me think of um, a quote I really love from Charles Bukowski is like, invent yourself and reinvent yourself. It kind of, that what brings me with this I, I talk as well, is that, so I can as well refer to my personal journey as an artist, is that obviously I come from traditional background with fine arts, then I got into digital arts and then it's for me, it's always interesting. How can you evolve and bring your skill set level to the new um, uh, reality? So again, what I learned being as a fashion illustrator was actually studying fashion illustration at LCF was that this is a very basic um, skill set, um, being able to draw on the paper, right? And for, I think what learned, what taught me that experience as a fashion illustrator and at this university was that I was being forced, how can I make it relevant in the industry? So, because obviously just being able to draw on the paper doesn't really go make you go far unless you just like have an exhibition, right? As a traditional artist, but I was more always interested, how can I make it the next big thing, right? So I think that's what led me also exploring digital fashion and AI and coming to the question you had about what's gonna happen. I think it is already happening right now because I know what's going on and I already been asked to do AI prompts or create campaigns. And these are like NDA contracts I'm doing under where brands are exploring what can we do. So it is happening, but it's not, I don't think it's, as open yet, you know? So obviously there's amazing examples I wanted to touch on, uh, which I absolutely love. And I get so excited every time I see a campaign being done by a, a brand like Attico recently, did this AI generated photo shoot in Casablanca, which were absolutely gorgeous. But again, I think there was a touch of human element because there was still a collaboration with photographer in it and stylists and, um, you know, a whole set of people, which is very interesting. So it's not that, oh, there's just one single person doing AI. It's a combination still of a team. And I think this AI person, not always, but can be that part of the whole team. So it is a process of like leveraging the, you know, production. And uh, it, again, I do still feel uh, certain elements of the jobs can be a bit replaced by AI. So, um, I think it's finding the way of staying relevant with your traditional skill set. So if you, let's say, are a photographer and you've worked in the industry as a photographer, it's like, how do you make sure that this photography does something that AI can't replace? So I feel like, again, for me, as an illustrator, I specialize in live illustration is one of my niche things. I don't think I can be replaced by AI because it's still human one-to-one -one experience. Obviously, yes, you can have a person do AI prompt of their portrait done live at the event, but it's still, it's completely different experience. So obviously I'll be happy to explore it, but I still have that leverage of like, this is me doing something very specific as an illustrator. And I know there's hundreds of illustrators now doing AI, but this one thing can't be replaced. So I think it's about finding this bridge again of what makes you super unique as a creative and how can you use AI as a leverage of your skill set that you've been honing for years. Um, so yeah, but definitely there's certain things like copywriting. Um, hate to say that, but I think that's going to be the first job that is massively challenged by AI. And I'm sure there's a way to overcome it, but I would fear that maybe this is one of the jobs that could be replaced by AI if not already is happening. So, but yeah, it's the world belongs to the brave, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually find it really ironic that when we did not meet with AI or robotics before, the general idea would be that, yes, they are going to replace us in all the boring jobs. And then we as humans will have more time to create, to write poems, to do arts. But instead, the very first use case of Gen AI are generating art, replacing illustrators, photographers, uh, authors of books. Um, I believe we're not yet in the stage where we're fully replaced. I think that it's the co-creation and curation that we're experiencing now. So yes, we might become less creative in a sense that we will create something from scratch, but you can still see if someone had a background in design in arts before because of the curation, you have to have a very uh, clear understanding of what was happening in the art industry uh, decades ago to do something that is contemporary and makes sense in the current reality. 
Uh, and besides of ours, there are obviously a lot of very practical use cases on how AI has been used uh, in AI chain, um, uh, well, uh, chain optimization. There is AI trend prediction. I am working as a trend forecaster and I'm working with uh, trend forecasting agencies where we write trend predictions for a year, three, five, ten ahead. And with AI, it's making us much more informative about what we are heading to because it's not just about the very internal feeling that all the trend for forecasters have to have. It's all the vast amount of data that is now being analyzed by AI and helping us to get the grasp of what's going to happen in the future. It's about optimizing supply chain for manufacturers, uh, which will obviously reduce the amount of clothes that are going to be produced. Uh, it's about co-creating with a designer or a company. So before ordering uh, clothes, I'm seeing a lot of really beautiful outfits here, and I'm pretty sure that once we'll have an opportunity to customize the garment before we're ordering it, uh, this will open up even a bigger array of expression, self-expression for us. So imagine Zara, is not producing hundreds of same uh, dresses per year, but instead uh, you will have hundreds of different options to optimize it, to uh, customize it towards your preferences, body shape, uh, skin color before it's being produced and ordered. So on-demand printing, 3D printing. Um, well, 10 years ago when I started 3D prints, I wasn't sure if we are going to have 3D printers at home in 2024. We still don't, but I believe once there are filaments that are going to be made from organic materials, easy we print our outfits at home i was recently uh, playing around with a dress x ai tool uh, i imagined myself on uh, the red carpet of Met gala i called it meta gala uh, i've 3d printed a virtual dress and um, this uh, brought me to an idea that hey maybe in the future if we can 3d print clothes at home from sustainable materials and uh, all those events like red red carpets and gala events, they require a one-off outfit. You're not going to repeat yourself wearing it. You can just 3D print it and then it can decompose. Uh, if it's being printed from, uh, let's say, leaves or organic uh, leathers uh, made from oranges. Um, it's already been developed. It's not just a futuristic idea from the very far future. It's all been developed and it's the matter of time and dedication of those companies. Because so far, a lot of use cases that we see that are coming to the fashion industry are coming from different industries. Uh, I was working with Tesla suit, which is a full uh, body haptic suit. The first use cases uh, that were funded for them were in military. It's military, it's medical use cases, it's all those industries that actually need to have rapid advancements. And after that, fashion industry comes. So a fashion industry is actually not as future forward as we see. We are only taking over of some of the advancements that have been happening in other industries and trying to adjust it for ourselves. And um, with that, I believe uh, if we are taking the best out of those advancements that have already been happening and applying it into the current supply chains, uh, we might finally reduce um, the second position of fashion industry being the biggest polluter in the world to maybe third, fourth, five, fifth positions. Uh, I hope. Let's hope. <laughs> It's a very optimistic view, but here, because we're all here together, we can brainstorm and can see where we are heading to. Yes, um, I might quote Samantha from her, uh, which, by the way, was another <laughs> yeah um, big news from um, Carla Johansson taking over the voice. So Samantha in the movie said that the past is actually the story that we are creating ourselves. We are stories. We are creating the stories. And if we don't like the story, we can iterate it. We can rewrite it. We can edit it. It's not a line that we have to follow. So let's rewrite it together. I love that. Thank you guys so much for that input. Sounds like, you know, the industry is moving very quickly. So it's a lot of focus on personalization, uh, customization, and really knowing your niche once you enter the industry and focusing on that and um, staying ahead of the curve. So thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for the panelists? Obviously, generative AI is a big topic and it's always the elephant in the room and we have some incredible thought leaders here. So if anyone has any questions, now's your chance to ask. Anyone? Hi guys, thank you for this talk. That was really um, inspiring. Um, my question is, how can we 
reduce the fear around AI? What can we do to um, have a wider group of people actually trust it and see the opportunity rather than be afraid of it? I personally think it's about education. Like if you if you think of a fashion brand and fashion brands at the moment are thinking, how can we use AI? This is scary. Is it going to get rid of our design team? What does it mean? But if they really understood what AI is actually doing, I don't think they would be scared. Like it's a 2D image. That's it. That's all it is. It's a it's a visual and it will help their design team to be able to ideate things faster. But it, they you still need somebody to input creativity into AI. It doesn't just go, oh, here we go. Actually takes a lot of uh, input to get to a stage of something you're even happy with. I think it's actually more time consuming than designing something. So I think it's um, I think it's a tool. And I think for me, it's about it's about really helping them and, and kind of making them understand how they can use it and not be fearful of it or not use it. I mean, like, I know that Nike have decided not to use it because they're worried about the IP protection and uh, that, that they don't they don't want any lawsuits. Or they can start to train their own models, you know, which a couple of other brands are doing. And then they, if you train it on your own data, you know that that can be, it will be useful for what you actually need it for. And you'll be in no um, lawsuits for using someone else's. I actually want to just ask you uh, in what way, like what field of fear in AI is it like from the creative process or like living with AI? In Because right now we are at this level of um, evolution, right? As you said, it needs a lot of input from others to create something, right? But as it grows and as it learns from us, from our creativity, people might be like, okay, what's the next stage, right? Okay, right now it helps us. When is it going to stop and how are we working around it? Are we already asking these questions, you know, like... You know what I mean? I think just being very philosophical right now, I think it's a nature of us as human beings to be fearful of the unknown. And I think AI is such an unknown, vastly subject we're exploring, each of us on Earth right now, in every aspect of life in general. But from what has diminished, for example, a lot of my fear as well is that it's not as dystopian and fast moving forward as it is. It's actually, yes, we are very at beginning of this revolution but i don't think it's like the process where in five years time robots are going to take over the world i don't think we're it, it's gonna if that's ever gonna happen because like you said louise i think it's and i agree totally with this it's like you have to come to the ai from creative perspective with the approach of i know what i want to achieve it's like i'm telling ai what i want to produce and it's actually i find it very we had a conversation with my friend today it's like sometimes i almost feel like i'm tapping into something spiritual where it's becoming a dialogue, which is like fascinating. I'm like, wow, like it gives me ideas I didn't even think about, but it's very linked to what I had in my subconscious. So I feel like it's befriending your enemy. And again, like what I said before, but it's like looking into the fears, into the eyes of the fear. Yeah, um, I love so that. the more befriending yeah. your enemy. Yeah. I mean, but it can be a friend. <laughs> <laughs> it become my you're besties now. So like, anyway. <laughs> but I still think it's like instead of turning away. It's like, again, to anything that we are fearful of, it's better to approach it and like even small steps. And just like I said, you said actually about educating yourself. I think that's the only way to go because it's inevitable. It's going to take over more and more, but I don't think it's going to be again, like it's such a massive rapid speed as we maybe potentially think of, you know, can happen. I don't think that's going to be the case. That's how I think about it, but it's like unknown stuff. So it's still important to be aware. <laughs> Thank you. I actually see where the fear is coming from in the general public is the unknown because most of the people that are not from this conference from the outside, they have never even tried using any AI tools themselves. So they think it's something very unknown and that's why it's scary. On the other hand, I am scared, not because I don't know about things, but because I know maybe way too much. If you talk to AI devs, uh, the inevitability of AI doom, which means that uh, 
Uh, you probably are not referring just to Gen AI tools, but to large language models. And um, that is another uh, side of where it can come go wrong. Uh, well, if AGI comes, uh, there is not much we can do. Before that, uh, just say thank you to our chat GPT after it answers your question, just in case. <laughs> just to be safe for the future. <laughs> I love that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. This was a wrap for the first panel. And thank you all to all our panelists. They're obviously very diverse. You know, Katie comes from a strategic background. Louise is more on the business side, but also a designer herself. Um, Adriana is an artist. And Natalia, of course, is a very forward-thinking trends futurist. So really diverse panel. I really hope you enjoyed their perspectives. But stay, stick around. We have a next panel with uh, Lacoste, uh, DressX, and Outlier Ventures talking about the future of couture. I hope you will join us for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.